so I'm the double minority at this uh, conference and at most uh, technology conferences I attend. Uh, I'm a, you know, obviously a black guy. And uh, of course, you know, you'll see very few at technology uh, conferences, but also you see very few magazine people, even few, uh, even fewer uh, magazine folks, because magazines have been relatively slow to meet this challenge of uh, moving to a, to a digital. And so when I was asked to do this, I was like, well, okay, you know, do I talk about the, the black thing? Do I talk about the magazine thing? And so I decided to try to mix those two things, because there's a, a little bit of struggle since I work with a black magazine. So it, uh, I'm putting that together. Um, so I, uh, what I wanted to talk about was essentially how you approach this whole move toward digital um, when you're based in race and culture also with what you do. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a weird thing, but just, just follow along with me. Um, most people don't necessarily know about uh, Ebony and Jet, uh, particularly advertisers when you go out there. Somebody yesterday was doing an interactive marketing session and they were talking about how you have these 25-year-old vice presidents now who, uh, who don't know a lot about history. And so you get a lot of folks who go, Ebony, Jet, you know, I've never heard of those things. Well, if you're from Chicago, or if you're new to Chicago, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of clue because the history of it is very important to understanding where we're going now with the, uh, with the digital part. Uh, so Johnson start, started here in Chicago. Uh, it's very similar, actually, to the Playboy story, if you know the Playboy story, though it predated it by about 10 years. Uh, but uh, John Johnson, our founder, started the company with about $500, uh, you know, did a loan up against his mother's furniture, the same thing Hugh Hefner did. Um, and then launched it into a company. It started with uh, Negro Digest, which was sort of a, uh, a, a small publication that had Carl Sandburg and Langston Hughes and uh, Martin Luther King and a number of people writing for it. It was an amazing publication, but at the time, just probably a little too smart, a little too ahead, a little too intellectual to have a broad audience. And so that was dialed back, but we kept doing it. Uh, but after that, it was decided to launch Ebony. Uh, and the reason for that was really because, obviously, you're talking about the early 40s. You're not talking about a lot of publications that had black images, certainly not positive black images. And so race and culture were a fundamental part of why the, was, was why the company started. Um, it solidified its place, really, in the early 50s uh, at the killing of uh, Emmett Till, uh, the famous story that happened in Mississippi. Uh, a kid from Chicago who was visiting Mississippi and who uh, famously after he uh, was killed, his mother said, you know, I want people to see this. So she left the uh, coffin open. And so thousands of people came to see this and we published the pictures in Jet uh, then and became a huge deal uh, to publish those pictures. And that really is what got the company rolling and got the company started and, and built, its, uh, built its national reputation. Um, what it really did was to chronicle black culture and black, black progress. The idea of it was that the more you show black progress in a positive light, then that's what motivated the black community to do better. That if you just did you know, straight out news and you talked about negative things that were happening, and particularly if you focused on, on race and racism, then you, you got you know, sort of a different attitude out, out of the audience. But if you followed uh, the people who were doing very well, um, he followed, you know, celebrities and, and authors and intellectuals who were leading the culture and leading the race. Then you could motivate people to move uh, toward that way. And, and what happened after a while, it became really the standard bearer. It became a fixture in the home and still is very much. A lot of families uh, have had their 15 minutes of fame in Ebony and Jet, and it's been critical to its uh, branding is that you know, everybody has a story of their grandmother being in it, their aunt being in it, you know, their wedding being in it, something like that. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I, my wife and I, uh, by accident, got into town and country. We had a spread on our uh, wedding. A uh, photographer happened to work for them. And uh, nobody said anything about it. You know, it was a big old spread, four pages. And I had a little teeny picture in Ebony and Jet when we got married. And I still, 10 years later, people go, hey, weren't you in Ebony? You know, didn't you get married? You know, and they still see this thing. But there's, there's been the, you know, the reputation that if it didn't, if it happened, you had to have it in Jet. And if it didn't happen in Jet, it didn't happen. And so that's been the story behind uh, Ebony. Uh, like a lot of legacy publishers, a lot of people who are dealing with this move to the internet, uh, we, like, you know, like Playboy and like Time and like a Life and like a number of other uh, older publishers, uh, owned the market that we had for a long time. Uh, so for a good half of its 63-year history, 
uh, Ebony and Jet and nine other publications that eventually started were the only thing going for the black community. We pretty much owned black culture in that sense. And so uh, the competition started coming in the 70s, but still today it's the largest uh, black publisher in the world and continues to be the largest circulation of any uh, magazine. And, and most importantly, what it did was really open up the national ad market to, uh, to black publications and you know, now to BET and, and other places. But uh, there's a, a whole floor of advertising that was really cutting edge that tried to convince uh, the folks on Madison Avenue that the black market was an effective market uh, to go to. Um, we expanded beyond media uh, and still do some of these, but it went to cosmetics, fashion pair cosmetics. I'll tell you a story, you know, this, this is another thing how race and culture grows a business. Uh, we had a, a fashion show, which you may have heard, the, the Ebony Fashion Fair fashion show. Uh, but this fashion show was traveling across the country and the models had to mix all of this makeup because they couldn't find anything their color. So Mr. Johnson went to Revlon and a number of other companies and said, you know, would you please develop this? Let's get in partnership and you know, develop makeup for these folks. Uh, they refused, they didn't want the business. So Mr. Johnson started, Ebony, uh, started Fashion Fair and now Fashion Fair is one of the largest cosmetics companies uh, for African Americans. Uh, hair care, books, television, radio, book and music clubs, all of these things became a part of the company and eventually became a half a billion dollar business. Um, and so now the challenge is, you see these pictures and sort of the history here, uh, the challenge is how you take that historic connection to a community and how you turn it uh, to the web and use digital properties to try to, to move it forward. And, and how do you deal with the dynamic of race now? Of course, what race was then and, and what education was then is, is a very different thing from now. You know, people are more sophisticated, they're more worldly, they've been around the, the world a little bit, uh, they make more money. Uh, their homes sometimes are much nicer than the celebrity homes that you used to feature. You know, what do you do? How does that change the dynamic as you move to a new medium and reach new people? Um, so here's the question that I get asked a lot. You know, I get an email at least once a week, and, and a lot of people get this who work in black media. Somebody, you know, will send a note, anonymously of course, that says, you know, what if I started Ivory Magazine for white people? How would you feel about that? Or, you know, why is there a such thing as black entertainment television? You know, what if we started white entertainment television? And the question, we, you know, the answer we always give, well, that's everything else already. So that's why we started. <laughs> um, but, but really, you know, just recently, uh, a couple months ago, you may have heard of RushmoreDrive.com. Uh, Rushmore Drive, you may not have. Uh, Rushmore Drive uh, was started by Barry Diller and uh, IAC Corporation. And essentially, it was a black Google. I mean, that was the, the, the version of it. We, we jokingly call it axe.com, but uh, that's a you know, bad joke. <laughs> but uh, it it's essentially uses the, the ask.com technology to, to try to uplift uh, closer uh, uh, relevancies, black relevancy into its search engine. And so the idea is that people who are looking for black content, if they go to this particular site, then when they type in Martin Luther King, they'd rather get you know, a king size sale or whatever they might get, they would actually get content on Martin Luther King you know, up forward. A lot of noise about this. I mean, Jeff Jarvis and a lot of people had a lot of problems with this thing. So it wasn't about whether it worked. The issue was, well, you know, this is separatist. You, know, you have this you know, complete world now of, of internet information. And within the context of everybody being able to see the world and see all kinds of information, why would they go to something black? Why does black media still exist within the context of this whole global digital revolution? Uh, and that's really beside the point, um, you know, because race is not necessarily about the color of your skin. It really is about the culture and an affinity. I mean, so the same thing, you know, the same reason why you have men's magazines, women's magazines, or Chicago magazine, because there's a you know, relative you know, similarity of interest for people who live in Chicago then that's the reason why you have ethnic magazines. Uh, but people are still struggling with this. And, and that's the part of the conversation that we have to have with advertisers as well, is you know, what is the purpose of this this day? What, what is its uh, need still? And so a lot of uh, companies are dealing with that. Um, and that's, again, you know, informs sort of what you do with your strategy. Um, the value of the audience is seen in a lot of other moves. I mean, just in the last couple of years, you've seen you know, Viacom bought BET. Uh, Viacom also is now really pushing VH1 Soul as it's you know, almost competitive to BET. 
uh, channel, but for you know, an older, more sophisticated audience. Uh, Time Warner bought Essence. Uh, Essence.com just did a big launch yesterday, a uh, relaunch of a, a big multimedia site. Uh, they've got AOL Black Voices in Time Warner. Uh, Comcast partnered with Radio One to launch uh, TV One. TV One just bought Black Planet. Um, IAC, you know, Rushmore Drive, Washington Post Company launched The Root a few months ago. Um, there was just these large black, black blogger awards. It's an online award that's, that's done, but 9,500 people, uh, 9,500 different blogs were nominated, and those are just the ones that were nominated. So you have this, this sort of large body of folks um, who are really trying to reach out the market, to the market. Everybody's taking a different approach for different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons that a lot of these major companies are doing it is because they have a sizable black audience already for their other properties but they can't sell it because they don't really know how to sell it. They've been selling you know, wealthy, educated, and the assumption by advertisers is that means white. But they haven't been able to sell or leverage these black audiences, so they partner with companies to launch uh, properties, whether it be black, Latino, or whatever, whatever the focus is, to be able to pull from that advertising uh, base that's trying to reach that particular market because they couldn't sell it in another way. Uh, and so you know, what it's done, really, all these folks getting to the game, you, we would you know, think we would consider a competition, and it is, but at the same time, it really opens up the door to the advertising market because the more big folks get into the game, the more it really justifies our existence and really justifies the market and says that there's a valuable market because everybody's trying to get into it and there's got to be enough money. And all of these folks are, are doing well and making money getting you know, different advertisers and getting different audiences. And that's the other piece of it, that, that what has happened now with people uh, going digital and all of these properties opening up for the market and taking new approaches is that it's really you know, justified the fact that black people are not just black. You know, advertisers used to have you know, some black money and then everybody else and you know, give the agency some black money and just spend it with some black people. And now they've realized that you know, black folks are different. You got young folks, you got old folks, you got you know, a whole mix of folks that you can get. All of these folks are probably reaching, might be reaching the same people. You know, what do people do these days? I mean, you, you wake up, you, you listen to, you know, you turn on the TV, then you turn on, you know, satellite radio, and you get in your car, and you've got terrestrial radio, and you get to work, and you watch, you know, TV on the side while you work on the internet, and you go to the web, you come home, listen to some more satellite radio, put in your iPod in the gym. You've got all these different places and many different ways to reach these folks, and everybody might just be reaching the same audience in, in different ways, but everybody's got a different approach. Um, you know, Time Warner, the, you know, with Essence, they're using you know, a, a basic website, but AOL Black Voices is a portal. Black Planet is, of course, a, a social networking thing. Rushmore Drive is a search engine. The Root is a news site. Uh, and black bloggers are doing uh, a million things. Um, so magazines, in general, black or otherwise. Five minutes? OK, I'm going to have to move really fast. All right, black or otherwise, here are some of the problems that people are having. One. Magazines have a greater perception of cannibalization. You know, people don't necessarily uh, want magazines on the web. And when you do put it on the web, uh, it's real easy fix for people who are paying for it to say, OK, I don't want to pay for it anymore because it's on the web. Uh, subscribers use the web a lot of time to manage their subscriptions, but they're not necessarily using the website in general. So you're dealing with the issue that all the people on the web may very well be very new to the brand and have nothing to do with the, the usual signals. Uh, Dwell Magazine, for instance, used to have you know, different names for its sections uh, in its magazine and then went to the web and realized that people didn't understand those names, so they had to change the names because their audience was com completely unrelated to their web audience. Uh, your long lead production, if you're a monthly magazine, you know, the web is daily. How do you make that switch in terms of production? Uh, many of the assets are undigitized. A lot of people think that these older companies who haven't you know, pulled all of their stuff to the web, that they're just slow. But you know, you're really talking about serious rights complications. You're talking about you know who took this photograph. You know, a lot of times they played with <laughs> those things a lot. And a lot of people would write for or take pictures for publications back in the day just because you know they could get that uh, that recognition. But they didn't necessarily sign a contract. So you're really dealing with huge, huge rights issues to be able to leverage those archives. And then you've got to digitize it because you're talking about you know film that's turning magenta in some cabinet somewhere. And all of that stuff has to be switched over. We've got 20 million photographs, 15,000 15, uh, hours of video, uh, 60, you know, uh, 63 years of one magazine, but we've had 12. So you've got all of this stuff over a period of time. And all of that has to be digitized to be able to leverage that. 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, you've got the, the whole problem of, you know, what if the people who come uh, online are not uh, your audience? If you've spent all your time saying that you're a black publication, once the barriers are down, once people don't have to go into the store and buy it and carry it and say they're carrying a black magazine and they're not black, but now they can do it in their home, what do you do if your audience completely changes? You know, that's, that's something you have to deal with. Uh, the big challenge, I'll go back, the big, really big challenge we've had to deal with is the globalization of black culture. Is that, you know, the world now covers black culture. We used to sort of own that and be able to, to get who we wanted for our cover and, and be pretty confident that once you, you put, you know, Jay-Z or somebody like that on the cover, you'd be the only person. But now everybody's doing that and you're competing with, you know, not only other black publications, you're competing with Vanity Fair, you're competing with everybody who's, who's fighting for the same major celebrities for the folks that you used to own. So, you know, once you move to the web, you've got to figure out, well, how do I do this differently? And so the way we approach it, because I know I'm running out of time, is what we wanted to do really was to leap over some of the boundaries that the magazine was having and essentially not do the magazine on the web, which is a very different approach that other people have taken. So rather than just move stuff over, which a lot of folks have done, just, you know, push it over and, and uh, shovel it over, we decided to just break all the rules completely get a whole new writing staff of, of, of folks, a whole new team of designers, change the logo, and just jump over all of the barriers that the magazine was having in terms of audience, demographics, and all of that. The, mag the, the magazine has an, uh, an average 41 age, uh, 41 and up demographic. The website is 18 to 39. And so it's gotten a whole new audience, 35% of which is white. Um, so, you know, again, that change happened just as we thought. And it's getting a whole new group of advertisers who are not necessarily advertisers on the magazine. As a matter of fact, most of our advertisers now do not necessarily advertise with the magazine and have looked to do whole new things online only. Uh, one of the things we've done is to recontextualize assets. Again, I mentioned we had 51, 000, I mean, 15,000 hours of video from a TV show we used to do called Ebony Jet Showcase. And rather than just bringing those up and showing old pieces of, of video, We've recontextualized and had new writers talk about them, what was the importance of those people, and what's their importance now. We actually have a partnership with uh, VH1 Soul, where they're doing documentaries on uh, old music artists, and then they're using our video and then shooting folks back to our website. Um, so a lot of the documentaries you see on VH1 Soul, they're using our footage um, for that. Uh, we've been able to drill deeper in the community. I talked about, you know, because you have the web and you're not dealing with, you don't have to deal with celebrities because you've got so much room, We've been able to really d drill deep into the community and talk about people, make stars of people who are not necessarily celebrities. And so this is what, you know, you can't do that with a magazine. You've got X amount of pages and 12 magazines a year. But with the web, we can really go deep into the community and find people and elevate folks who are not, would not necessarily be featured in the magazine. Uh, the results, again, the web demo is younger. Uh, the design and approach have changed. We've gotten web-only advertisers. Uh, the, I feel very strongly that if, if a publication does a website, that the website has to have its own proposition. It has to be its own product. It has to have its own P&L and make its own money aside from the magazine. That if the magazine fell apart for whatever reason, that the website could maintain its own audience. And that's what we've been able to do with this one. Uh, we've established you know, great partnerships. We launched the first uh, black YouTube channel uh, or by a black uh, media company in a couple of weeks. Um, we found a way to digitize all of that stuff and we'll be doing a major announcement of, of all of that where you'll be able to see all of those publications that we did over the years from the 40s until now. Uh, with uh, VH1 Soul, Legacy.com, where actually one of our core, uh, core things was weddings and celebrations and so we've been able to launch that. My time is running out and we've been able to really reduce risks for our consumer goods divisions. They've been able to, because we can experiment and grab new audiences, those folks can now say, all right, I can get new audiences for these consumer goods and develop new brands. And that's one of the main uh, points of this. Uh, and so quickly, you know, when, you, when you make this move from an old publication to, the, uh, to, a, to the, the web platform, one of the things you can really do is just establish a platform for your other brands and for expanding out beyond a publication. What we've talked about is doing things like furniture lines and other things, not necessarily with the name of the brand because we've been able to build an audience using the web as a platform. And by considering ourselves an authority or, or creating an authority relationship in things like music and other things on the site, then we can then move into those products once you establish an authority in those particular subjects. 
uh, quickly, do I have two more minutes? Yeah. One more minute? All right. So here's what I want to talk about race and culture and how this changes uh, technology. Uh, one of the issues is how does race and culture change some of the tools you use? So here's a couple of things that, that happen. We decided to create a map, and rather than just do a regular map, the idea was to try to map black culture. And rather than just doing a Google, it's just a simple Google API, but what changes is the context. And because of the context changes, the, how we develop the tool change. Uh, and so what we did was to tell everybody, make a big call to our audience, tell us what happened on your block in 1960s doing a riot. Tell us you know, some story that we could find out no other place but from you or from your community, and let's map it out. So rather than just be putting statues and museums and those kinds of things, things that you can find on any map, tell us about your stories and the things that we need to know about that were instrumental to, you know, where, the, where did the funky chicken start? Where did, you know, where did Willie the pimp you used to hang out? You know, whatever was really important to your community, map that out, get us a picture, and we'll put it up. And that's what we've done. So we made this a user-generated black culture map that's beginning to map out, if you will, black culture. And so, you know, race and culture sort of change the context of the tool. Um, another thing we're doing is trying to track black spending. You know, you know that maybe one or two percent of uh, black spending actually goes back into the community. And so by using a mapping technology and matching that up with, uh, with where you can actually buy from black businesses, we can then begin to shape action with, with a simple tool by saying that if you change these three habits, you buy these things from a black business, you'll get this much of an upgrade in how money is spent in the black community. Hit this map, it'll show you where you can do shoe repair, these three things, and then you get an uplift, you get an action-oriented uplift uh, with just a mapping tool. And so, you know, context, again, and culture change the tools. Uh, so I'm gonna stop. Uh, these are some of the lessons learned. Again, digital media, you know, has trained consumers to expect change, so old media folks can, can feel that they can really change because digital media has opened up and trained folks to see things really fast. Um, you should really recontextualize your stuff, not just rerun it. And uh, uh, culture can shift and, and change the approach of how you approach not only the web, but the tools that you create for it. And I'll stop. Take too long, but thank you very much. All right.